Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, we've got a very special guest. She is an NCAA champion, the University of Notre Dame. She ended her Notre Dame time as the most decorated swimmer in school history. She was a professional swimmer. She lived in a van for a while, <laughs> down by the river, I'm sure, at some point. <laughs> yep. Today, we've got Emma Rainey. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. We grew up swimming in in similar parts of the world. You're you're from Lawrence, Kansas. I'm from Columbia, Missouri. So I always knew your name. You were always way faster than I was. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had mutual friends. It was good. Yeah, good old, some, some, <laughs> good old Missouri Valley. Good old Missouri Valley. Um, and then uh, you know it's it's cool because the swimming community is a small world, and and we're never very far apart. You know, we're both still involved in swimming in one way or the other and that's cool but um today let's start with let's start with kind of the recent past or let's start with today where where are you right now uh yeah. throughout this pandemic uh how have, how have you been dealing with things what have you been up to that's a great question so right now i'm in lawrence kansas my hometown in my high school bedroom at my dad's apartment um <laughs> so i have been here since right before thanksgiving um, started off the pandemic for the past, well, I guess technically next month, I will have been a California resident for three years. So I was living in San Francisco two years prior to the pandemic. And then once it hit, I was kind of down while well, we were all over the place, Tahoe, San Jose, um, with my ex-girlfriend and her family. And then when it was probably around June, we were like, you know what we should do? We should buy a van and we should build it out and we should live in it because why not? So we did. <laughs> and I can, do you want me to go into the whole detail about that now? Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> Let's cool. get into it. <laughs> so that was something that I have done previously. So after I didn't make the Olympic team, after swimming was done, I moved to Australia for a year just because I could. And it was something that you know, when you're a swimmer, you get one day off a week. So I was going to take full advantage of being able to travel and go as far away as humanly possible for a year. Um, so I, I nannied for nine months and then I traveled around for four months. And during that, that traveling time, I tried out van life, uh, both in New Zealand and in Australia. And I loved it. And so, you know, June hit and we were like, okay, we're in this for the long haul. What can we do to maximize our time? What have we always wanted to do? let's be yes men. So we started looking and we actually found a van in Iowa. <laughs> Classic, you know, nice. it's cheaper than finding one in California. That's for sure. And it's, it was an old crime scene unit, which was hilarious. And I think the guy tried to hide it from us, but we were like, Oh my God, that's a selling point for sure. <laughs> um, and my mom actually is still in Lawrence and she drove up with a friend and, and got it for us. We, we paid her the money and she paid the guy and drove it back down and then about a month later, we very carefully flew to Kansas City from San Jose and then worked on it for pretty much six weeks straight. My ex-girlfriend um, was in between jobs. She was a teacher, so she was on summer break. So she pretty much worked on it all day. And then I would take meetings and do work and then boff in when I could. Um, it had like a basic frame, a uh, twin bed and countertops and a fridge. And then we did everything else. We painted it. We extended the bed. Um, we added little bits and bobs, tables, chairs. Um, it had a solar panel. It, she was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so that okay. took, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you, I think, especially for people kind of around our age, this is becoming, you know, kind of a, a thing it's becoming yeah. pretty popular, especially just renovating in general, whether mm -hmm. it's a van, a house, whatever, you know, tree house. Um, how, how did you how did you gain the knowledge to do this? You know, it's like throughout this process, how were you learning how, how to go about all these uh, renovations? Yeah, it was a combination of quite a few things actually. So my dad is um, 
a professor in design, uh, theater design. So lighting, costume, scenic design. He's always been a very handy guy. He has tools laying around. He's built all of my furniture from when I was little, um, built his own guitars out of cigar boxes. I'll plug him later. I know he's pretty cool. (laughs) So he was really great in helping us. We're like, we have this one piece we need to get here and we can't figure it out. And he would be like, well, you have to cut a notch here and then slide. So that was one piece. Another piece was YouTube videos. I learned how to take the dash apart and install a multimedia system by myself by watching a YouTube video. And then the place we were building it is the studio of um, an old friend who is a crop artist. I don't know if you saw his work on the Biden campaign, Um, any of those Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, the earthworks in the fields. That was the the guy who we were staying with. Um, So he obviously had a lot of tools and a lot of knowledge about building things. So we got very, very lucky. And then Megan, Mike's girlfriend is just, she loves to build things. So even if it wasn't pretty, it was sturdy and it, it worked. (laughs) Nice. Uh, So, so you build this van, you, it sounds like everyone in your life is just super handy and knowledgeable about these things, which is sweet. And very supportive. Uh, (laughs) Nice. And so how long does that, does a process like that take? Well, for us, it took about six weeks and that's not even starting from scratch. So, um, and that was full time for the most part, well, at least one person full time taking like a day off here and there. Hmm. Um, and then let's see what else about the building process. I mean, there were definitely days where we were super frustrated and just didn't do things. So we probably could have gone a little faster (laughs) if we really wanted to, but we also weren't on a timeline. So nice. And so, I mean, then you build the van, you, you have, you have this, uh, finished product and then where do you take it? (laughs) So our goal was to get back to California Um, because I, all my stuff, I had obviously moved out of my apartment in San Francisco because there's no point in paying rent during a pandemic, especially if you own a van and especially if it's San Francisco. Yeah. (laughs) So all my stuff was in a storage unit in San Jose near her parents' house. And that included like all of our kitchen stuff and a mattress and things we needed to put finishing touches on to like really make it a home. So we were just going to slowly make our way back to California again, no real timeline, and then swap some things out, do that, and then kind of regroup and go from there. So we went directly west to Colorado, um, Denver, and then friends in Aspen. And then we went down to Utah and did Moab, um, Lake Powell, went to Arizona and did Flagstaff, Sedona, um, and then back up through Utah kind of and did Yosemite and Mammoth Lakes, which was crazy because there was a a horrible fire burning at the time we were in Mammoth Lakes, just right on the other side of the mountain. So it it felt like we were in Mordor, like you couldn't see anything and the sky was orange. It was really bizarre. Probably should have looked that up before we got there. I don't know. And then back to San Jose and then we took it up to Tahoe for a little bit and then back to San Jose. And now the van is chilling in Alameda, California with one of my other friends. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) You retired the van life. Uh I mean, so I, I had a friend who, who did a similar thing. He, he bought a van in Iowa. Uh, What? What is it? I don't, I don't, it, it's, it must be a thing, I guess. Um, he, he, he was, so it's very random he was in you know he brought it back to missouri renovated it did the whole thing and he said after he did it for about five ish months you know he mm-hmm. traveled he went stayed with friends in colorado other places you yeah. know and then he was like a oh, dude i couldn't do it like living in a van's rough i mean give me yeah. give me some of the nitty-gritty of just not having a a house you know, not having those kinds of amenities and kind of being just out there. Yeah, I think, and this was something I realized, you know, towards the end of the month that we were living in, it was, I'm in a very different stage of my life than I was when I did it in Australia. Um, When I did it back then, what I was 22, 23, 23. And I just, I didn't have a job other than to travel. Like I saved up for nine months while I was nannying just to do this four month excursion across Oceania. 
And it was just so carefree. And I was in this, you know, fun young phase where who cares if I couldn't shower every two days? Who cares if I only do laundry twice a week or every two weeks? Um, It was all about the thrill of it. And then this time around, I was still working. I was still working full time. Um, We had a a Wi-Fi router. (laughs) Yeah, which... um, in theory was supposed to be very easy to set up online. It had great reviews, but we just couldn't seem to get it to work. And then Megan was also job hunting, but we couldn't be on the router at the same time. So that caused a lot of stress and tension because I was, I was still taking meetings. My whole company knew what I was doing. They were very supportive. Um, But that just added a layer of stress that you can't really enjoy all the things you're seeing and and experiencing, uh, which is kind of the point. So it took a little bit of the fun out of it. And then, you know, doing it at 27, 28, you're starting to get to, I mean, at least for me, I was starting to get to a point in life where, you know, kind of having roots and having a schedule and a place to go home to that was consistent was sounding nicer and nicer. Um, and I mean, I wouldn't change it for a thing. I don't regret it, but I think the the work aspect and then just, finally coming to terms with maybe I'm not that crazy 24 year old world traveler anymore. And like, I do just want a couch and a laundry room. I don't know. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, that makes total sense. I've, I've been in situations like that where it's like you're in the middle of the mountains and you're on vacation, but you also have to have a zoom call or like cover, cover a swim meet in at 6 a.m. and the internet's being spotty and you're like oh my god because it's not just about you anymore like you have a team and you have people that are counting on you and then it just the stress compounds which isn't fun yeah so I yeah I didn't I mean you had mentioned it but I guess I didn't realize when you were all were on the road you were still both essentially still working Mm -hmm. I mean that's whoo yeah that's a lot yeah it was and during a pandemic, you can't necessarily go into coffee shops. I mean, it depends on the state, it depends on the city, um, and it depends on how comfortable we felt with it. There were a couple of times where I had to present to our CMO and I, I needed good Wi-Fi. So we just had to bite the bullet and, and hope there weren't a lot of people in the coffee shop or sit outside. So there were just a lot of factors that we didn't necessarily account for, but, um, you know, that's, that's life. <laughs> Yeah, de- definitely sounds like a learning experience, but dude, yeah, just hearing you talk about that stresses me out. Yeah. Um, yeah, sweaty palms. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I want to, Australia sounded cool and we kind of glazed over that, but you know, it's like, like you said, totally different stage in your life. You had just finished swimming. You mm-hmm. were doing, you were doing van life in Australia and New Zealand. Um, were, were you solo for that trip? Did you ha- meet people along the way? T- t- break that trip down for me a little bit. Yeah. So that was something that kind of fell into my lap. Well, I knew that I wanted to travel after swimming because it's always been such a passion of mine and, and swimming lets you travel to swim meets <laughs> and that's about it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so, like I said, I wanted to go big and I was actually back home in Lawrence after swimming ended and I was bartending here and I was just kind of, you know, being like, what next? And I had some friends that had been au pairs in Australia and they loved it, you know, fancy word for nanny. And right. I put my name on some of the free sites cause I didn't want to pay for a membership. And I was like, this could be weird. Like I could get some weirdos reaching out to me, but <laughs> we'll see. And, uh, within a couple days, I had a family reach out to me that, um, their mom had actually passed away about six years ago at the time that I was talking to them. And it was just a single dad and these two kids. And um, we Skyped once or twice. And I was like, this sounds too good to be true. What the heck? Um, My dad was of course skeptical as well. He's like, I'm not going to send you to Australia to this random guy you've talked to twice. Um, And then just some signs happened in the universe and I realized it was time to go. So I bought a one-way ticket to Melbourne and I was there for nine months with that family. And I, I can't put into words how amazing and incredible that experience was. And that family was, I, I honestly don't know how I got so lucky. Um, it, it was just the best. They were about an hour South of the city. So we were in a suburb near the beach and the kids were my best friends. They were such weirdos. Um, I'm, I miss them every day. Uh, at the time they were 
eight and 10 and then turned nine and 11 while I was there. So old enough to kind of do their own thing, but um, not old enough to be angsty teenagers yet. So (laughs) it was perfect. And then, yeah, after that, after the nine months, um, I, because in Australia for the working holiday visa, you only get a year unless you decide to do farm work to extend to two years, which it's so complicated. They didn't have the farm work option open to Americans until halfway through my stay. So it was too late. So I was like, okay, I have three months left on my visa. I don't, I love you guys, but I don't want to spend it all of it here with you. So then I drove up the East coast for a month in a van with a guy that I also met on Facebook two days before we left. And we are still super close. We were like brother and sister bickering, fighting, but like just always up for anything. We went skydiving um, off the coast of Airlie Beach, which is the Great Barrier Reef. Um, spent way too much money, but had a blast. And then I went to Bali for a couple of weeks. And then I went back down to Australia and did basically all the major cities in Australia. Then went to New Zealand. Um, and actually Elizabeth Beisel met me there. So we spent 10 days in a van together. <laughs> we spent 10 days in a van together in New Zealand and it was... <gasps> It was wild. We tried to hit so many things in 10 days and that it's just not possible. So we spent so much time in the car just talking and singing and she would play guitar and and I would sing and we would do funny voices and just I have so much blackmail on her from that trip. It's hilarious. And it was over my birthday. Um, So we went to a wine or or we did a, a wine tour with a bunch of crazy Kiwis who they still write on my wall on my birthday now. Like it was it was so fun. And then went up to Southeast Asia and did most of Southeast Asia alone. So um, Vietnam, Thailand, um, and then had a friend from Notre Dame meet me in Thailand in the last two weeks of the trip. And then back to the States. That's, that's a lot. I feel like we could, I, I feel like I could do a whole podcast just on that, but. um... I know you also have to stop me because I, I'll just keep going. And I know I'm, people probably don't want to hear me just yap for 20 minutes straight. I, I love it. Okay. <laughs> and I'm the host, so w- what I say goes. But okay. what you say goes. Uh, however, um, so so it sounds like during that time, a lot of travel. Um, mm-hmm. You had some companions for some of it, and you had you were solo for some mm-hmm. of it. And I, I feel like those two. I feel like that's very different. Traveling alone and traveling with people. Do you? Not do you have a preference, but what are the differences for you on those two things? Yeah, I think so. I'm an only child. Um, I am, I have been very used to doing my own thing on my own time, on my own terms, mm-hmm. my whole life. Um, I've been very independent. And so I think that aspect of traveling alone is something I really like where, and I, I'm also a, a people pleaser. So when I'm traveling with someone else, I always want to make sure that they're doing like, they're having a good time. We can do whatever you want to do. It's fine. Like I, I kind of sacrifice my wants and needs for, for someone else, which usually is not a big deal. Cause I'm, I want to do it all anyway, yeah. but I think traveling alone, you can do whatever you want and not feel bad about it. But also at times it was really lonely. Um, I, I learned that because I'm someone that thinks I can do it myself all the time, but I learned that you have a much better experience and a much richer experience if you just make friends and you jump in and you just go for it. Because especially in Southeast Asia, that's what the majority of other people are doing anyway. Like it's a lot of solo travelers and you make these connections a lot faster than you ever would elsewhere. Um, And so there were a couple groups of Canadians that I still keep in touch with that we met in Vietnam and then met up again in Thailand. Um, So that's fun. I I did have a a rough experience in Bali because I was staying with a friend of a friend who was uh, very strange and I was alone and I felt weird and honestly a little bit unsafe at times. And so I was like, I have to go to a hostel and I have to make friends that are my age and not creepy. (laughs) Yeah. So there was that, but then also on the flip side, when you're traveling with friends, especially people like Beisel or my friend Jenna, who are just up for anything and want to make the most out of their time there and constantly make you laugh, it, it just levels everything up. And then you can have these memories with these people you've known forever for years and years to come. And Oh, I don't know. I won't go into stories. We'll do those later <laughs> or some okay. other time. All right. Some other time. Uh, 
we'll we'll have to we'll have to do just a uh, just a travel podcast yeah yeah oh another plus about traveling with friends is when you get like bolly belly or tie tummy you're not embarrassed because it's one of your best friends and you're like i i'm really sick i need help <laughs> that that is that is it sounds definitely like a plus that's not fun when you're alone dude yeah i feel like getting sick in a foreign country is like a nightmare for me yeah it wouldn't wish that on my worst enemies yeah um (laughs) so okay so lots of travel i could talk about that forever but take it back a little further um you go to australia after you're fine after you're done swimming 2016 Mm -hmm. i'm guessing Yep. All right. So tell me about that final year of swimming um, from 15 to 16, where you were a pro and you were training with Swim Mac? Yes. Half the time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the more I recount my life, the crazier it is. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So graduated from Notre Dame in 2015 in May and the day after graduation drove from South Bend, Indiana to Charlotte, North Carolina with my mom, Mm -hmm. um, all my stuff in my turnaround. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know if you know anything about senior week. Um, but I hadn't swam for about a week and I had done nothing else, but, um, imbibe. (laughs) And so that was really fun to show up and be like, hi, David, I'm ready to train now. Um, (laughs) got and, uh, booked an apartment when I think I was in Charlotte for spring break that year, just to like get the lay of the land, find an apartment, had gotten everything squared away so that when I moved there in May, I I was ready to go trained. um, And just, so I had also trained with swim Mac the summer before in between my junior and senior year, um, because my head, the head coach of Notre Dame trained under or coached under Brian or my God coached under David at Auburn. And so they were good friends and he thought that I would benefit from, from David's training. And I had a great time that summer, um, swam really fast. And so I was like, this is going to be awesome. We'll do it again. It just didn't work out the next time around. I don't know. I I think I was probably in a different place mentally because I had just lost that, you know, safe bubble world of Notre Dame. And I knew I wasn't going back and I had had such a good time. And I was now thrown into this like adult world without actually being an adult. Like I didn't have a a nine to five to spend all my time at and meet new coworkers. I, my only job was swimming. And so I would go back to my one bedroom apartment and sleep and eat and do it all over again and like not really branch out from there. So it was my own doing, but I didn't realize. So I swam horribly that summer. It was, it was really bad. And I was just unhappy all around. And I called some of my contacts at Notre Dame, um, some of the assistant athletic directors. And I was like, I'm really unhappy. I, I think what would make me feel better and and help me finish out my swimming career on a strong note would be coming back to Notre Dame. And so the new head coach, Mike Litzinger was like, come on back. We can, we'll figure it out. Um, and some people in the athletic department offered me a part-time graphic design job, with the office of student welfare and development, just so I could fill my time and have like a little bit of a paycheck. Um, so I moved back to Indiana in September of 2015, started getting my butt back in shape thanks to Mike's training. And then in November, I went to the Minnesota Grand Prix and swam pretty well, came back the first lift back. I dropped a 40 pound dumbbell on my finger and shattered it oh my um, gosh. and you would think like it's just a, it's a finger who cares um but they had to put pins in it because I had I had literally shattered it into dust and they needed to bring the three pieces back uh, together to form uh, the knuckle again so I looked like I had been probed by aliens I had three little things sticking out of my finger and they were like you can't swim with this because if this gets if, if it gets infected it's your bone we will have to amputate your hand if, oh if this gets infected, I was like, just cut the finger off. I don't need it that bad. <laughs> it's November. I have what? Eight months, not even, right. up, not that long until trials. And so the first couple of weeks afterwards, I just sat around, went, went to the pool and watched people swim. And then I ended up putting gauze and then a condom and then a plastic bag and then tape and then kicked <laughs> on a kickboard 
with my <laughs> hand. <laughs> uh huh. So <laughs> the pins were in until January. And then by that point I was, I mean, if I could go back and do it again, I, I would have done it totally differently, but I was not mentally there anymore after that all happened. And I didn't know what to do about it. So I just let it ride. And mm-hmm. I'm surprised I got ninth at trials, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I, so what would you have done differently? I would have done everything <laughs> humanly possible to talk to someone about, you know, mental health, to get a sports psychologist, a regular psychologist, um, get me back in the headspace of being competitive and wanting this, or at least trying. I was just, I, I didn't really care anymore. I was just trying to make it to trials to say that I tried, um, which is just such a shame. And that's the part I'm most disappointed about. I'm, I'm really not that sad about not making the team. Cause I do think it was time for me to be done. Um, Mm -hmm. I am very happy with how my life turned out after swimming, but I just wish that I could have left the sport, uh, still like passionate about it and, and knowing that I left it all in the pool in those last couple months, because that was kind of how I, how I lived my life, um, in the pool up until then. Like, I was like, I'm, I'm going to do my best all the time. I'm going to leave it all in the pool. And I just, I don't really feel like that at the end. Yeah. Were, were you someone who, once you were done, you didn't get in a pool for five years? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did a couple clinics with uh, Fitter Faster. Mm-hmm. And then I swam a few times in Australia. Um, but I mean, there was the ocean. So I would have rather done that. But then it's not that I hated swimming. It was just that, especially that last year, I kind of saw swimming as something that had taken all the other things in life away from me. Um, So I really wanted to do those first. I wanted to run. I wanted to go to the gym and like do aerobics workouts. I wanted to walk. I wanted to surf. Um, And I was very happy doing all of those things. Like I didn't miss swimming. Plus, especially when I moved to San Francisco, swimming is hard in a city. It's expensive. It's $25 to drop in and getting to the pool itself (laughs) takes 45 minutes. So no, I'll just go. Golden Gate Park is right there. I'll just go for a run. (laughs) Makes total sense. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And so it sounds like you had a really positive experience at Notre Dame. Um, I mean, when, when you coming out of high school, what, what was the good fit about that for you? Why, why did you end up choosing Notre Dame? I love this question. Um, so before whatever, July 1st, whatever the date is, they could have called us back then. I had mm-hmm. this list. I was like, okay, I grew up in Lawrence. So I want a college town. Like I love college towns. They're so fun. So cool. And I want a combined men's and women's program because I never had guys to swim with on my swim teams growing up. It was always just huge groups of girls and the guys were younger, older, whatever. Um, obviously wanted good academics, good, good athletics, a, a combination of both. I like really wanted somewhere on the coast, like out of the Midwest. <laughs> and so I had trips booked to, I went to Virginia. I went to UVA, loved it. Went to Texas because I had grown up going to Texas swim camp. Um, my grandma lives outside of Austin. And then I had a trip scheduled to Florida after my trip to Notre Dame. And the reason I took a trip to Notre Dame was because Brian Barnes, the head coach at the time, coached the Lawrence Aquahawks when I first joined, when I was eight. He was the head coach of the Aquahawks when I was eight. And so he was the first person to call me at like nine on the dot, July 1st, and was like, please just hear me out, just take a trip. And I was like, I mean, that that means he's really interested in me and that's really flattering and I'll I'll throw him a visit. Why not? <laughs> so I went and it had nothing. So I don't know if you've ever been to something. There's, I haven't. I've heard it's, n- there's not a lot. <laughs> there's nothing there. Um, the teams were not combined. Uh, obviously as far as swimming goes a little bit heavier on the academic side than the athletics that the swim teams hadn't really done like a whole heck of a lot. They'd won big East a couple of times. Um, And it's still in the Midwest and it's even colder than Kansas. (laughs) But the only way, I don't really know how to describe it to you. I knew I needed to be there. I, I felt it 
in every part of my body. I was like, this is right. I, I don't know what it is about Notre Dame. It, it just feels right. And I, I've always been really proud of my intuition and being able to listen to my gut. And every time I have, it's been correct. So I went back home. I took a nap after my trip and I woke up and I turned on the TV just randomly. I was like, okay, I'm going to fold some laundry and watch TV. And Rudy was on TV. Like the, I didn't even change the channel. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I knew it. So I <laughs> called the coach. I called Brian the next day and I was like, I'm coming to Notre Dame. I canceled my trip to Florida. And that was that. Nice. <laughs> Did there no other than a gut feeling. That's all I had. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's awesome. That's, that's what you want in a college recruiting trip, right? Is, is yeah. to end up to, to come to a campus and, and just have that feeling of this is, this is where I need to be. Yeah. Yep. And it, it was totally 100% spot on. I would not trade a second of my time there. I, I had the most amazing college experience. And I, I realized it's a big question, but you know, just what, what made it so amazing? What were a few of the maybe bigger, bigger events that you remember or just bigger things that changed for you that grew you throughout your four years there? Yeah. I mean, I think some a period of time throughout my career there that really stands out to me was my junior year. I, I was just so happy that whole year. I lived in a, in a quint, <laughs> which was technically a quad that they s- just shoved one other person in, in a very <laughs> old dorm with four of my teammates. And we were on top of each other, but just constantly laughing. It was so fun and just the year before I had been in a single and, you know, me being an only child and wanting my own space, I was very nervous about it. And I think that year really proved to me that the more you lean on other people and the more you just open yourself up to other people, the, the better everything else is going to be. It just permeates through the rest of your life. Like I, I did really well academically that year, which just seems like it wouldn't make sense if I'm constantly laughing and up late with these other girls. Like I, I was just distracted all the time, but because I was having such a blast, it, it really did leak into other parts of my life. And that was the year I won NCAAs blaze and set, set those records. Um, and something that's special about Notre Dame is that you live on campus your first three years. And so you're just always surrounded by the magic. Some people could call it culty. I mean, looking back, it was probably a little culty, but you're always surrounded by the magic and the essence of Notre Dame. I lived, you know, I I could see the dome out my window. The Basilica was two buildings over. So the bells were playing. Um, There's just always this kind of like buzz in the air of, you know, there is a little bit of pressure sometimes because it's really academically intense, but just, just knowing that there's amazing things going on there and you're always in the middle of it because it's this one square mile, um, that you never leave, That's crazy. (laughs) which I know a lot of people would hate and a lot of people do. That's why they, they end up not coming to Notre Dame is because they're like, I don't, I need to get off campus after freshman year during freshman year. I don't know, but we had everything we needed and it was just, yeah, it was so fun. So I, certainly didn't realize that you live on campus for your first three years. Do you, Mm -hmm. I mean, did that make a big difference for your senior year? Um, a little bit. I mean, it, it it was a little odd just now all of a sudden being thrown into this house that you kind of have to take care of and like (laughs) you're paying rent other than room and board. But I mean, we had, it's not like we were locked on campus. I had a friend um, whose family had a condo in the same neighborhood that I ended up living in senior year. And so we spent a lot of time there throughout my first three years. Um, it was, and, and also living with swimmers again, my senior year, like you're still in that safe space of people that you already spend so much time with that understand your struggles, um, that, that get why you're in a bad mood, um, that understand why you ate their eggs because you were so hungry. Um, so at least there was that consistency of moving off campus <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and off campus was still like maybe a 10 minute bike ride to the pool from our house, like getting in the car to the pool took maybe three minutes in the morning. So it wasn't <laughs> like that far. 
Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Not a huge separation. No. Um, nice. Okay. So we barely talked about swimming. I just realized. Um, <laughs> That's okay. It is okay. It's okay. <laughs> but I do want to ask about swimming. I guess if it's swim, um, swim, we should do that. <laughs> um, I mean, when once you got to Notre Dame, where was your headspace coming into college in terms of swimming? Were you still very into it at the end of high school? Were you someone who is like, I'm really ready for something new? What, how are you feeling about swimming coming into college? I'm trying to put myself back in that headspace. I think, <clears throat> I think I was just excited because growing up um, on the Aquahawks, we didn't, we it wasn't that intense. Like I hadn't touched a weight until I got to college, we didn't lift weights. We did dry land. Um, I didn't start doing morning practices or double subs 15. Um, and so I think I was just excited for this whole new world of, of athletics and being a whole athlete and not just a swimmer. Like we had nutritionists all of a sudden we had strength coaches, we had a sports psychologist, we had all these people that were willing to help us and sport administrators. And I was like, Whoa, this is amazing. This is so cool. And the, a similar thing happened my senior year of high school where I was just like really ready to experience senior year of high school and be a high school kid. And I was in a show choir and I was in just a lot of like extracurricular things. So swimming did kind of take a back burner after I committed to Notre Dame. Cause I was like, okay, cool. I'm set. Like I can mm-hmm. enjoy senior year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I also think going in to Notre Dame, I was a little scared that I was going to get my butt kicked. Um, I was definitely out of shape, but then it was pretty apparent that everyone else was in the same boat as me. So it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. Did you get your butt kicked? Were you someone who could, who could excel at training? Yeah, I was a workhorse. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, I did get my butt kicked. Something that was, oh my God, I'm getting like PTSD thinking about it, but we had our, um, strength and conditioning coach was terrifying at Notre Dame and you had to be, I love her. E if you're watching this or listening to this ever, I owe you everything and you're my favorite human in the world, but we were so scared. Um, (laughs) You had to be matching. You, we had color, you know, Mondays it's white shirt, green shorts, Wednesdays it's green shirt, blue shorts. And if you don't wear the correct Uh, color, the whole team is punished. If you're late for by a little bit, like a minute, the whole team is punished. Um, and the workouts were really, really hard. One time someone wasn't counting their reps and we did up downs for 20 minutes straight and she, but she didn't tell us when we were going to stop. So we were just doing up downs unknowingly undetermined amount of time. Um, 25 minute wall sit, uh, sled push relay, just stuff like that where, yeah, I had never experienced that kind of thing. And then you're expected to get in the pool afterwards and like bang out an IM set. So dang <laughs> mm-hmm. uh <laughs> wow that's <laughs> that is intense yeah um was was what i mean what was training like at notre dame for you in the pool in the pool brian was someone that especially freshman year believed that we should all try to get better at all of our strokes if possible. Like, obviously there are some people that just cannot physically do breaststroke and that's fine. But I I came in as an IMer, and my backstroke was atrocious. Like I was, I was faking, literally faking it till I made it. I, I had no technique. No one had ever really taught me how to do backstroke because they were like, you'll be fine with the other three. And so (laughs) he made me do main sets, stroke sets, backstroke a lot of my freshman year. I, I had to swim with the backstrokers freshman and sophomore year and freestylers um, because my freestyle was just muscling. But I think that's something I'm really grateful for down the road was just understanding that you're not just a breaststroker. We need, and, and everyone's not just this. We in Notre Dame was not super deep in a lot of things and we needed people to be versatile and, and go wherever. And so his belief that we need everyone everywhere just in case. And then as we got a little bit older, he kind of let us specialize, but, um, I don't know. Yeah. I'm really grateful for that sort of training and that my backstroke got better. (laughs) I feel, I feel like that's a good philosophy 
just <clears throat> especially in developing athletes of yeah, yeah. you want to you want to be able to do everything because ultimately that's probably just going to make you better at right. whatever I mean, it is you do yeah i think that's something that uh club coaches do a lot for younger kids but you rarely see it at the collegiate level um and i think at notre dame where it was hard it was harder to get buy-in from people because a lot of girls were there for school and swimming was just like a way to do that. And we had a great time and we loved the team, but there, there were definitely those people and um, making sure they knew that they were important and they were needed, you know, wherever we were, whatever meet it was, um, I, I think helped get, get some buy-in and, and some trust for him. Yeah. Uh, was there ever a swimming set that stood out to you at Notre Dame? Oh my God. I actually would need to call it. It was an IM set and it was like, Oh God, it was, it was, I think it took an hour and a half and it was some sort of ladder 400 IM set, but Brian, I I blocked them all out. I think (laughs) Brian was a kook. He was a weirdo. I don't know if you've ever met him again. He, he was another person that shaped me into the swimmer I was. And I'm so grateful. I, I know I wouldn't have had the success I did without Brian or E. Um, but he would do things where we would curl up in a ball on the surface of the water. And then he would, we'd have our heads underwater and he'd take a wrench and hit the side of the pool. And then when we heard the wrench hit the side of the pool, we had to blow all of our air out and sink. And we would do that for like 45 minutes. And it was just like random weird drills like that, that I was like, this is such a Brian thing. And then after we did it, he would explain, I'm teaching you to blow your air out quickly and efficiently. And it was just kind of all over the place, but it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is kooky, yeah. but yeah, that's <laughs> it sounds lively for sure. Yeah. Kept things interesting. There was a couple Saturday morning practices that were so long that he had bagels delivered in the middle of it. And we were like, you want us, want us to eat bagels and cream cheese in the middle of, of a four hour practice and then get, get back in the pool and do fifties fly on 45. No, thank you. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty wild. Um, okay. So, so, so it sounds like practices were hard, but lively. Uh, yeah. And, and, and then moving to, you know, just meet experiences. Do you have a few memories from meets that stand out to you? Yeah, I think, I don't know, this was the first one I thought about, but um, we were in the big East my first two years and then switched to ACC my last two years. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got a little bit of both, but my first conference meet ever big East we were, our, our big rival was Louisville and we were a little bit more evenly matched that year than the, the rest of my years, but uh, it came down to, I, I don't think we were going to win, but we really wanted to win the last relay. And I, as a freshman was pooping my pants. I was so scared. I was so nervous. I was anchoring. I think it was what relays last at collegiate meets for 800. I think, three? I think four free for free. That's what free it was. Relay. And I was anchoring and 400, a hundred freestyle for like, okay, (laughs) throw me in, I guess. And uh, my teammates could tell I was nervous. And so we were standing behind the blocks and every year we, we did a pump up CD where everyone put a song on and Mm. mine was a tech nine song, (laughs) the beast by tech nine. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) KCMO. KC. (laughs) (laughs) And everyone loved it. They ate it up. And so they were like, okay, Emma, look into my eyes and we all just like welcome no ball get 50 must make mojo so we were we were singing and then I got up on the blocks and everyone else had gone and they're like you're a beast you're a beast and I won and I just remember being like okay as long as I got my teammates around me we're gonna be fine um that's something that stands out and then obviously junior and blaze well first of all ACC's when I won no one knew that I had broke the record including me the mm-hmm. American record. The announcers didn't, no one knew. And so I went over to talk to my coaches and they were like, well, that's really fast. And then my assistant coach gave me a hug. And I think she had just looked it up and she whispered in my ear, like you just broke the American record. And I was like, oh, that's funny. And I was like, <laughs> she was like, no, I'm serious. And I just blank, absolutely no clue. And then 
at NCAAs when I hit the wall and all of my teammates that were there rushed to the poolside and were like hugging me over the deck and I was crying and they pulled me out and just, I mean, that's the reason you do it, right? Like it's, it's cool to get the acclaim for yourself, but I would not have been there if it weren't for them and to have them share in that moment with me um, and be the biggest contingent we had ever brought to an NCAA meet before was just surreal. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it, it's, an, it's such an interesting dynamic from conference to NCAAs because yeah. conference is such a big team energy and there's so, you know, I mean, energy is like palpable, right? And then NCAAs, mm-hmm. it, I mean, it's definitely an energy, but there's so many teams that it's don't have, yeah, it's more <laughs> tense, but then, and then there's so many teams who only have a few swimmers, you know, you don't have the whole team. So I didn't, that, that's a really interesting piece of context is that you had a lot of your team there. I mean, did that, I'm guessing that helped a lot through that race. Were you pretty confident heading into that tuner breast final? Yeah, I knew I was going to (laughs) win. I knew I was going to win. I was pretty sure I was going to go faster. Um, But that kind of goes back to that feeling I was talking about earlier, where that season, I knew I had left it all in the pool, every single practice, every single weight session, everything I did, I knew I had done my absolute best, which then left, there was no room for doubt by the time I got up to the blocks at Instant Blaze. But it's just, it, and I've talked about this before and other things. I think the thing that I'm most proud of throughout my Notre Dame career is letting people know that you can swim fast at Notre Dame. You can swim fast at these schools that are, you know, classically academic schools or, you know, just football schools or whatever. Um, and so, being that successful at that meet and having, I think we had nine or 10 girls, including divers there, which was the biggest we'd ever had. Um, we had three coaches where my first two years we had one coach. (laughs) So they were like, everyone had their hands up and I was like, Oh my God, this is a true team experience. I get to share this. And they were around the podium when they gave me the award and I had parents and family there and it just, it wouldn't even have been as close to a suite if, if they hadn't all been there. Absolutely. And I feel like it comes back to what you said of just, you know, getting on campus and having that gut feeling of, okay, this is where I belong. And I mean, if you feel, if you get that fit of like, oh, okay, I think this is where I'm supposed to be, then you're probably going to be successful. Yeah, exactly. And just making the most of it and, and leaning in and then leaning on those around you for sure. Those were my best friends. That's cool. Uh, okay. I, f- I feel like that's a, that's a good natural, uh, stopping point for right now. Emma, yeah. I appreciate you coming on, you giving us some swim context, some travel context. I've learned a lot in the last hour. Good. <laughs> Thanks for letting uh, me talk about myself. Dude. Yeah. We're going to have to bring you on and because we didn't even talk about living in San Francisco and, uh, we can talk about traveling a lot more, but anyway, Any parting thoughts before we sign off today? Oh my gosh, I should have thought about that beforehand. Um, No, I mean, I guess, yeah, I just want to say thanks for reaching out and and thanks for doing this and keeping me involved in the swimming community because it really is where my my heart is and always will be. And I'm so grateful to the sport and and everyone in it, every aspect of it. Um, And yeah, I'm just really honored to be here. So thank you. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.